Okay, the next step is to sort out the video issue now. I was looking at the schematics and uh, I know what's going on. Um, this is a segment of the video circuitry of the Atari 800 XL. Uh, at this point here on the emitter of transistor Q3, we have the luma signal, the luminance information. And on the emitter of uh, transistor Q5, we have the color or chroma information. Now, if you look at this and you follow the traces that lead from this chroma point here elsewhere, one of them wraps around here and it connects here and here, and the other one goes up and connects to the same two points. So, in fact, at these points here, we have, uh, uh, although it, it's written here, composite luminance, actually we have a full composite signal also on the DIN5 connector here, the back of the, of the computer, uh, we have a composite signal. So this thing is not really generating S video at all. These are composite signals which go into a DIN5 jack and into the S video input of the television, which then interprets it as pure brightness and it expects color on another uh, separate pin, which is not connected here on the DIN5. And that's what's going on. We are getting composite being sent into the brightness input of the television on the S-video uh, connect connector. And the television interprets that as pure brightness, therefore black and white, but it's composite. Let's quickly review this once again. This is the complete schematic diagram of the Atari 800 XL. The entire computer is in here, but we don't need to look at all of it. We only need to pay attention to, this, to the video generation uh, part, which is this part here in blue. So let's zoom into that and see what we find. It all starts here with the antique, which produces uh, the digital information uh, that is to be displayed on the television. That is then followed up by the GTIA, which converts that information into analog signals that can then be buffered, combined, and sent to the television. Uh, specifically, these four lines here contain uh, luminance information, uh, which is then uh, buffered and combined together, and it appears in its final form here on the emitter of transistor Q3. And then this other line here is the color information, analog, produced by the GTIA, which is then buffered and appears in its final form here on the emitter of Q5, which is also the joint between resistor 67 and resistor 68. So these are the two signals uh, we are interested in sending to the television separately, because that's what S-Video is all about. But uh, surprisingly enough, the Atari combines them uh, in this closed looping here, um, and the uh, color information is combined with the brightness information, and then after combination, then they are sent. Uh, probably this is uh, the RF modulator to produce the RF signal, and this is uh, uh, the DIN 5 connector, 5-pin DIN here, that is supposed to be S video, but even on the diagram they write a, a composite video. So they are both composite signals. To, to avoid this, we have to open this ring in here. One way to do that is to remove capacitor 54. That would already go a long way in separating the signals, but there would still be this other line in here combining the signals around. So I will also remove capacitor 55. And then I will pass a bodge wire from chroma uh, to the DIN uh, uh, 5 uh, uh, connector. And this signal here will still go there as well to a separate pin on the connector. And this will be pure brightness information. And then we will finally have proper S video. These are the, let me see, here. These two capacitors, C54, C6, C6, C54, and C55. I'll remove them. Uh, in order not to mix chroma and luma. Uh, the only problem is that uh, the RF signal will probably become uh, black and white, but uh, I'm not going to use the RF signal anyway. So, to help with this. Look, you go away, go, go. My cat insists on participating on the process. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. C54 and C55, these two. I'll remove 
and then I have to find this point where R68 and R67 connect in series or the emitter of Q5 Q5 is this guy here so there is a trace coming from the emitter of this guy probably somewhere around here I have to find and then I have to install void wire from there to the appropriate pin on the DIN5 connector which is probably empty right now but first I'll remove uh, these two guys C54 and C, 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 C54 and C55 are gone. Okay, so these two are gone. Now I have to find this junction here between R67 and R68. Oh, they, oh, they are here. R67 is right here and R68 is right here. So I think they join together on this side. Let's let's have a look <coughs> with the multimeter in continuity mode. So if I'm correct, this is R67, this is R68 and they join on the right side. Or maybe the left. Yeah. Yeah, they join here on the left side. So any one of these two pads here is enough because it will be here. That's where they join together. So any one of these two pads, let me just make absolutely sure. Yeah. I flip it it's to the left any one of these two pads right here so let me show you a close-up this is the, the pads of the two capacitors we removed and this is the place where R67 and R68 <coughs> join together so if I put a bodge wire from here all the way to here, I think, I think this is the out check, but I'm pretty sure this is the chroma pin on the DIN5 monitor connector. So bodge wire from here to here, any one of these two. And uh, then we will be done with this <coughs> modification. <coughs> um, this is the RF shield connector. So I probably don't want to do it like this. Otherwise it will be not the connector. That, that's where the RF shield sits. So I have to go around it like this like so yeah this length will do I, I create a, a little hook at the end of the bodge wire because it's easier to just hug the remaining pin uh, on the pad like so I don't know whether you can see uh, let me see like this see a little hook I'll do here on this empty pad of the DIN5 connector first 
because it's just easier. And I will add a little bit of uh, solder. And that will do. Now a little bit of kept on tape to make sure that the route is correct and doesn't go in between the RF shield and the, and the board. I am unlikely to put this RF shield back, but uh, I want to keep the option of doing that uh, open, of course. Sorry guys, my vision is not too good, so I need to do that under the magnifying glass. So here's the bodge wire connected to this pin on the DIN5 jack, goes all the way here and connects to either R6. T7 or R68 at the point where they join together. Okay, let's uh, give it a test. Uh, let me just look at the quality of the solder joint under the lens. Yeah, looks pretty good. Just to make sure we do a quick continuity test. Yeah, we have a uh, good continuity. Time to test it. Okay, it's connected up. The proper S-video circuitry is now in place. Let's uh, test it and see if we get color. Yay! We have color. We have color and proper video quality. <laughs> Indeed, there is just no doubt about the excellent video quality that one gets with this modification. The video is sharp, the images are clear, the colors are vibrant. I'm very happy with it. I've connected up the RF cable now and as suspected, RF is now black and white. Atari was very confused when they designed this thing because the way it was, this thing was neither S video nor a composite. <laughs> it was a hybrid of the two. It's quite remarkable. Probably people didn't notice it because nobody used the monitor port back in the day, or very few people. Everybody was using RF, and RF was getting a composite uh, signal. So they would get color. While I was working on the board, I noticed that some of the solder joints in one of the Glue Logic 74 type uh, chips were not looking very good, so I've decided to reflow them, and that's what you saw me doing just now. And I'm checking, make sure that it's all okay. Now I turn my attention to, to the keyboard, to restore the keyboard and try a new keyboard membrane that I had in stock. I did exam the older membrane and I actually couldn't find anything wrong with it, but since I had a new one in stock, which you see me uh, pull out now, I've decided to to try that one. And all these little keyboard springs, I'll treat them with WD-40 to clean them and make sure that they will not uh, oxidize any further. And now it's the laborious job of pulling out all the keycaps to wash them. And 
now a, a good uh, brush down the, the the main keyboard assembly. It was very dirty, needed some some attention and care. That's a metal cleaning product you see me using there with a fiber cloth. And there is no secret to washing the keycaps. I just uh, let them soak for a few hours in water with the soap, cleaning product for floors, and I'm just uh, scrubbing keycap by keycap. Now this part is a little tricky. Uh, you have to fold uh, the two sides of the keyboard membrane very precisely, and you may benefit from the help of an extra pair of hands to make sure that everything matches up as it should. Okay, I've connected the new keyboard uh, rib, uh, uh, membrane connector. Uh, let me just turn this thing on first. So I'll turn it on and let's see what happens. Yeah, now nothing. Okay, I just could not get the new membrane to work. If I connect the membrane alone to the computer and I press it with my fingers, then it does work. But the little springs uh, on the back of the Atari keyboard are just not strong enough to make this new membrane work. It just doesn't. Even the thing in between is a lot, the layer in between is a lot thicker than the original. But uh, even with the original uh, in-between in layer, I couldn't make a single key of this membrane that I bought off eBay new uh, uh, work. It only works if I press with my fingers, putting a lot more force than the springs uh, can. Um, I'm sure that the intention was the best. Uh, these are enthusiasts, hobbyists, not companies that have quality control and all that. So they did their best, uh, but in my case, it just uh, didn't work. Maybe there is something that could be done, but uh, I refurbished uh, the, old, the old, uh, membrane. I cleaned it very well with IPA and with a two-step uh, contact cleaner, and it seems to work fine. So let's do a test of the complete machine. It's not put all the way back in the case. The, uh, the top part of the case is just to provide some mechanical stability, um, but let's do a test now. So there it is, uh, the refurbished uh, ribbon connector of the refurbished uh, uh, keyboard membrane. Uh, let me see if this is on. That is on now. Here's the, here's the switch. Let's see. Three, four, five, nine, zero, delete, break, yeah, this, uh, this seems to work. I will reboot that, the, the computer now, in uh, an auto-test, uh, self-test mode. Okay, let's do the self-test first memory.
Okay, that's good enough. Let's try another test. Uh, let's do a keyboard test. We already just tested, but let's do it. Yeah, looks good. Okay, I keyboard is finished. It's working perfectly with the refurbished old uh, membrane. I put a little extra protection here with some Captain tape just to make sure that it doesn't break the traces. The next step is to salvage uh, a few bits and pieces uh, of the original case. And now I'm giving the game away. I'm not going to reuse uh, this case. It's still in a more or less okay condition. If you give it a good clean, uh, it should be very close to the original color. Actually, it is the original color. It's not yellowed up at all. Um, but I have some special plans for this, which I'll reveal <laughs> very shortly. I want to save this bit. And now, I have something to show you, which is this. This is a transparent plexiglass case for the Atari 800XL, which lets you see from here and from the back the PCB inside, and I love that idea. It looks blue now because it has a protective uh, pellicle uh, uh, glued on it, but it will be transparent. Um, there are several pages of instructions, what, what you have to do in preparation in advance. Uh, I think I already did that. And then the steps, you have some spacers at the bottom, plexiglass, and you mount the PCB on top of it. Shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, let's get going with it. I'm, I'm wearing gloves, uh, not to leave fingerprints uh, on the inside of the acrylic once I peel off the protective pellicle. And these are ESD safe gloves, so I don't need to use my usual ESD wrist strap. I'll be using this, uh, which, is, which is a cleaning and anti-static uh, uh, product. Uh, plexiglass uh, is liable to produce a lot of uh, static electricity when you rub on it, and it's not conductive at all, so that static stays there, and once it finds a way to, to, to go out, it does, and it may zap components. So plexiglass and computers are not natural uh, companions. But if you use this, it should be safer. And once the computer is, uh, the board is firmly placed on the bottom of the case with the spacers, then there is no problem anymore anyway. Uh, but I have this, so I'm, I'm going to use it.
So the screw positions on the case just don't match the keyboard. You have because I managed to match up to three, but uh, the fourth one would just not align. Well, so I just had to force it a bit by putting the screws a bit in a diagonal, as you can see in these photo details. It's not pretty, but it, it does work and it feels very robust. Okay, the top part is done. Now it's time to put the whole thing uh, together. Here's the transparent Atari 600 XL. It is very beautiful. It is a very beautiful case. And of course, of course, you can see the bottom. <laughs> the whole motherboard board is uh, is visible. And uh, it's the view from the other side. We do it like this. There, you can see all the memory chips in there. There is no doubt, it is a very beautiful case. Because it showcases a beautiful PCB. Which one is nicer? <laughs> a bit of a no-brainer. <laughs> And what better way is there to close off this part 2 of episode 6 than by playing some of the fantastic games in the Atari library, some of the games that have marked my childhood. In this renovated, restored, better than new Atari 800XL. I'll leave you now with some pictures of this very successful restoration project. Will there be a part 3? I don't know, maybe, but if there is, it will be a very special and very, very technical one. We will see, stay tuned! <laughs>